Well, good evening again, and uh, I have the privilege of sharing a, a Wednesday night message with you all again, uh, continuing in Luke's Gospel series. And I'm very excited about this one. Uh, actually, uh, it might be a little bit longer than my usual messages, but uh, I just feel like a lot of things are coming together. And we've been looking at uh, Jesus' ministry and I'm particularly uh, using the filter of what was happening as he developed the disciples to uh, carry on the, the gospel after his death and resurrection. And uh, I see that this week's lesson is really centering in on the inside of Jesus's ministry, and it's just amazing. So how appropriate for amazing God and his amazed people. And it's going to be Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 36, if you'll turn there. And um, as I said, we have been looking at Jesus' ministry uh, through the Gospel of Luke here. And we've been doing this for about uh, 22 weeks. And I feel it's appropriate to take a, a, a little time here to do an overview of what we have seen of Jesus' ministry. What was it like? Uh, it's like no other ministry we could ever imagine. And uh, we get, of course, a, a great model for how we are to do ministry, how we're to uh, live and to share. Um, but we also see Jesus developing uh, everyday, ordinary fishermen, disciples, into bold, confident uh, men of God that could be used by his Heavenly Father. So let's take a, a quick walk through of the lessons we've had so far. And yes, there have been uh, 22 weeks of this we've been doing it. So uh, here it goes. We started in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 22. And there we're reminded that was in the power and authority and authenticity of the Spirit. And Jesus actually declares his mission. We have a mission statement in verse 18, and uh, where it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord upon me. Then we uh, moved to his hometown, and we found that uh, his audience, his hometown of Nazareth, was blinded to the Spirit, and there was rejection. In the third week, we saw that Jesus' ministry had authority over unclean spirits. Moving into chapter 5, Jesus begins to call forth his followers. And there's a simple little test. He allows uh, Peter and James and John and Andrew, uh, men who were just fishermen, to let down their nets and a simple test of obedience in what they already knew how to do, and they would find that they had a new calling to be fishers of men. Whether tackling, excuse me, whether touching a leper to make him whole, or forgiving sins of a paralytic uh, let down through a roof by four um, very diligent friends, each day in each city or each place, there was a divine appointment in a certain city, in a certain place. Every moment was important. We see the calling of Levi, also known as Matthew, the tax collector, who leaves his post and follows Jesus. And we see that Jesus calls the sinners to repentance. And we hear the phrase, which is repeated several times, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This was Jesus' style. We then went back to the beginning of the story because it was around Christmas time, and we saw how God inserted himself with mankind. And we were told of the miraculous and amazing birth of our Savior. We're getting the, the backstory of Jesus. We followed that with John the Baptist, the one who would announce the ministry of Jesus and prepare hearts to receive. And we witness God's declaration and the Spirit's descent. 
even his genealogy was going to authenticate Jesus' birthright. After the dove lights on Jesus and Jesus goes into the wilderness, tempted or tested, Satan's target was our title. And filled with the Spirit means that Jesus is a dangerous to Satan. And we too could become Satan's target. And how did he answer it? With the Word of God. Then coming back to where we had left off in chapter 6, walking with Jesus, we find on more than one Sabbath day that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's a teacher and of, of a deeper truth. The great multitudes are challenged to consider what were uh, to consider uh, what were they expecting was the title there and Jesus Beatitudes point to the cost of discipleship if they were expecting just the king to come and to be on the coattails of um, overpowering the Romans no Jesus had an entirely different uh, method message here uh, Blessed to be to hunger and to mourn and to thirst and to be revived. If you want to be a world changer, we also learned in chapter six, you need to fix your own heart, love your enemies, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who hurt you. You want to be like the Son of God Himself. Not only that. But don't be judges, that is condemning. And you need to have good fruit, and only good fruit uh, can come from good trees. You need to be regenerated, you need to be born again. We completed chapter 6 with perfectly taught disciples do what Jesus says. They purposely choose the foundation on the rock, not the sand, and obey like the centurion in chapter 7, who accepts Christ complete authority to heal his uh, servant just by his word. Also in chapter 7, the fickle people look to Jesus for a quick fix to their problems. They want the great reversal, the great redo. But what should we, should we be seeking? We should be offering righteousness back to God. We should be looking for that right relationship and living uh, right with God. We completed chapter 7 with Simon takes the Savior for granted. Simon was uh, probably a, a rich man who had a home and he opened a home to have Jesus as a dinner guest, maybe to be entertained by the great teacher. But it was the woman who had been forgiven of much and anoints his feet with her fragrant oil and her tears that shows us that you need to love Jesus with all you've got. In chapter 8, as the crowd, crowds build up and the ministry is expanding, perhaps even, as we said, a pivotal moment, we get an inside look at the everyday Jesus. He is authentic, 24-7, to the women who supply the traveling band and to the, the, his disciples who uh, he gives a special audience to explain his parables, the parable of the sower in particular there. Will the crowds truly hear and perceive? True family are the hearers and doers. Continuing in chapter 8, the disciples have witnessed so many miracles and seen ministry and healing and so to so many everywhere. Now they witness his power and authority on full display. First on the stormy water, and then on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where he releases a man from legion, many devils. And we see the man clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus, and told to tell what great things Jesus has done for him. Coming back across the lake, Jairus' daughter is raised back to life and the woman's issue of blood is stopped. 
and we learned that by his stripes we are healed. It's not just the healing, but it's being able to have peace with God that Jesus has with his stripes was his sacrifice, his bodily sacrifice made peace for us. That was on Good Friday that we shared that. And then we followed up with the ministry to the multitudes is not greater than the ministry to the close disciples. Jesus sends them forth. He turns them loose to minister throughout Israel with power and healing. What an experience this must have been for them as they uh, do what the master has been doing. But their excited debriefing is interrupted with a lesson of having compassion on the weary and hungry masses that are always there and always needful. And what do they get? A basket of leftover fragments to remind them of their Heavenly Father's miraculous provision. This is what we have seen so far in ministering with Jesus. It has been I want to say quite a ride, but probably more of quite a walk, walk and quite a travel, quite an experience. All the needy people and Jesus always having time and compassion and a total balance in his approach, always knowing what to say and what to do. Throughout our venture tracing Jesus' ministry with his disciples, we can't stop being amazed at our amazing God. Luke seems to relate the lessons and encounters in such a way that each new week seems to offer a revelation that climaxes all that came before. And Luke 9, 18 opens with what I will call an oral exam to his disciples. I uh, had an oral exam myself once when I was preparing for uh, my doctorate at Northwestern University and we knew these orals would be coming in the second year to see if we were worthy to continue the program, the expensive program. And there were many a sleepless nights wondering what would this group of professors have to say. But Jesus gives an oral exam uh, sort of off the cuff to his disciples. And he asks, who do the crowds say that I am? Which is really a question that's going to be put to them. It's a lead into, you know, what do you say? Do they really understand whom they have and been walking with? And three are about to be selected for a graduate class revealing uh, who Jesus really is. But first, Jesus is going to lay out God's plan for himself and for those who truly desire to come after Jesus. So let us now go to Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 22. And our title is, Is It Our Plans or Hear Him? And it happened, as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him. And he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. Jesus was not seeking for information. He knows who he is. He was not seeking for affirmation. His Heavenly Father alone and the Holy Spirit were capable of affirming him. So why do you think he surveys the disciples? Why the oral exam? Why put that question forth in and at this time? Why? Shouldn't they know who he is? Shouldn't they have great confidence in all they have seen? If anyone should know, they have seen Jesus day and night, eating and sleeping in every uh, situation. Uh, they should know who he is. They have seen him still the waters and even uh, raise the dead. 
I believe they need to confront the ideas and opinions with the palpable knowledge that they should each have had. They need to express that and confirm that and come to that realization audibly. Put it in front of them. Isn't it amazing that the people are quick to speculate, well, John the Baptist, because he was beheaded and uh, maybe something magical has happened here, mystical, or Elijah, because uh, Malachi tells us Elijah must come and then they generalize that to one of the prophets. It doesn't it almost seem as if they wonder but don't have answers and are willing to just put in almost any answer that it's beyond comprehension. But whoever Jesus is, he's very special. They would acknowledge that. But Peter, it's always Peter. He nails it on the head, says the Christ, meaning the anointed. Christ is the Greek for the anointed one. The promised Messiah is effectively what he's saying. The deliverer uh, prophesied from of old, really from Genesis 3.15, but probably he's thinking about the prophet that Moses spoke about that would come. The, the prophet, the anointed one, the Messiah. We see this same confession and uh, the same situation uh, reiterated in John's Gospel. And so let's just turn there a moment in John chapter 6. That's towards the end of the long chapter there. And that's the chapter where he has fed the 5,000, just like he has done here in Luke. And then he goes into a, a quite a discussion, or John goes into a, quite a discussion that Jesus is the bread of life. And uh, we see then in verses 68 and 69, uh, this was after uh, some of the disciples, some of the followers were beginning to leave Jesus because Jesus' teaching was um, getting difficult for them, causing them to have to discriminate uh, between, is he just someone wonderful to follow after and listen to? Or is he demanding uh, all of my life? And Jesus wants to know if uh, any of his close disciples here want to uh, betray him and leave. Interesting and ironical as that is. And uh, Simon Peter answers, verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a powerful confession. What an accurate statement. And yet, is it possible that he did not have the full import of what he was saying there? That we can say and affirm and still have limited clue, I don't want to say be clueless, but limited clue of what we're really saying and handling. Let us uh, continue with Luke. We left off in verse 20. Let's continue with verses 21 and 22. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the, raised the third day. He strictly warns them that this, for now, is a private revelation. Why the privacy? Why keep this uh, on the down low? Because this is actually explosive knowledge that they have to know what understanding they were handling. Then, uh, as we read in verse 22, Jesus accurately and clearly foretells what must happen and by whom. At the end of Luke, Jesus will again say that, that the 
Old Testament prophecies must be fulfilled and Jesus must die and rise again on the third day. Uh, and then they will pre be prepared to actually hear. Could the disciples process these facts? What paradigm shift was needed in their thinking? These words, these that this Messiah would die and suffer and then rise in three days. Overwhelming statement. No doubt they heard it. No doubt they recalled it by the Spirit after the fact. And of course it appears in the Gospels in multiple places. Jesus did tell them. But what does it take to be able to process that, to hear it, to grasp that does not all fit with the narrative that they probably were building in their own mind of who Jesus was and what was going to happen. And sure enough, their nation, their leaders would ruin everything, raise the third day. This is recorded and understood only in hindsight. Could they possibly have properly figured this into their current understanding? Perspective is a funny thing. And I have an example that's personal to me that we've experienced in this past um, eight months or so. You've heard me talk about uh, the miracle of a Christian school where my wife and my daughters and I teach and how we uh, need to move and relocate. And uh, God has blessed us with a wonderful opportunity to buy a property and, and a building and uh, make that our home. But things aren't going as fast as we would like, and we're still in the former place for now while we're trying to make things happen, uh, get permits and so forth, and raise more funds. But reflecting on this process, uh, if I look back about two years ago, uh, we were con contemplating and going to a, a different church one where uh, some of us as teachers had taught before, where the Christian school actually had its roots. And uh, that church uh, entertained our proposition, but then uh, they are in a rebuilding stage themselves uh, as far as their congregation. And in their nervousness, they said, well, uh, bringing in a Christian school possibly 100, 150, some people would uh, put a load on their, their water needs. And, and so one of the things that we propose is we, we'd be willing to spend $20,000 to help them with water testing and, and get that all situated. But as we offer that in our the leadership was thinking, wow, $20,000, that's a lot of money. But if that's what it takes, that's what we'll do. And uh, that, those discussions went on for almost a whole year, but the answer turned out to be a closed door. And, and uh, I laugh now, looking back, saying, well, 20,000, that's nothing compared to what's in front of us now. A year ago, the proposal we were looking at was with another Christian school in Adams County and thinking of, is there some kind of partnership or a joint venture that we could uh, entertain. And uh, as we got to know them, we realized that they uh, had indebtedness and it might take uh, re leaving them of their debt, perhaps fifty to $100,000 to just say some figures. And again, as leadership, thinking, wow, fifty to 100000 and we barely just seem to pay our bills as it is. How in the world do we do this? But if that's where God's leading us, okay, we'll entertain those thoughts. But COVID came and uh, their minds changed and we went our separate ways. That door also closed. And here we are, having spent over 320000 have a property that is ours, a building that is ours, and all winter long, uh, volunteers and parents uh, uh, getting to do uh, demolition to prepare for the renovations. And possible renovation costs, now that we know we have to put an elevator in and uh, meet certain code requirements, could easily be over a million dollars. Hopefully it won't be that way, but 
20,000, 50,000, 100,000, how perspective changes. In hindsight, we now see what were our concerns back then, hardly anything. Looking back on the ministry of Jesus, the disciples were not able to comprehend, I'm sure, what Jesus was laying out for them. God's plans were great. He wasn't just ministering. He wasn't just healing for the moment. He wasn't just raising the dead for a memorable moment. He was coming as God living among his people, his beloved people. And he would be the ultimate sacrifice that for all eternity could make us right with him. How are they able to comprehend all that? What is it like to do ministry with Jesus? You need to have a very open mind. Be willing to have your perspective changed. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 reminds us that eye has not seen nor ear heard what the Spirit has prepared for us. Isn't ministry with Jesus amazing? It is glorious. And we're going to continue here with verses 23 through 27. And when you think it couldn't be any more amazing, Jesus takes it to a whole new level. A whole new level. Let us read. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come to me, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Just notice a few things here. He said to all, okay, not just to select, but to all, that we need to take up our cross. That means we have to deny ourselves and have no personal agenda. To take up your cross is literally to be willing to die, to die uh, an excruciating death, as Jesus himself would experience. And it's daily, it's ongoing. It's a death to self and to our personal wants and desires and agenda. And yes, it's daily because we can't just speak that once for all. We are very human. We're very, very mindful of our desires. They creep in and scream at us all the time. Follow Jesus. Need to, we, we need to receive daily instruction to have Jesus' GPS. And if we want to save our life, that is truly have a purpose for living, a legacy to leave behind, an ultimate meaning, then we have to lose it. Seems so uh, oxymoronic and contradictory, but it is the great truth. Lose it as in give it to him. He alone can possess what we never could have held on to anyhow. Even if one should gain the whole world, and some truly have tried, there have been leaders and conquerors who have aim to do that, to have their power exercised over so many. But the soul destroyed, then you have nothing. You are lost. If you're ashamed of Christ, you'll be denied by him. Uh, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33 add to that. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. 
But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. It may seem blunt, but it is the truth. Do we find ourselves hiding identifiers of our faith in Jesus under certain circumstances? This is one of the challenges I see here. Do we seek out wrong affirmations, trying to fit in with those people or situations that oppose righteousness and righteous living? Well, the kingdom of God is real. And some of the very disciples who were with Jesus at that moment would see a reveal of Christ in his kingly and glorified position. And those continue with the Mount of Transfiguration. As I said, could this get any more amazing? And apparently it can. Verses uh, 28 through uh, 36 will conclude what we're looking at today. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were fearful as they entered the cl cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. And they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. This Mount of Transfiguration passage is uh, also recorded in Matthew 17 in Mark 9, and then Peter also references very directly in 2 Peter. We'll be looking at that later. Uh, let's take a look at this postgraduate class in discipleship, almost the ultimate here. Uh, some details. Uh, Luke says it was about eight days. The other two gospelers say it was six days, and they don't say about in the sixth day, but about eight days, six days, all right. Uh, in other words, not immediately after the prophecy that some would see, not see death until they saw the kingdom of God. But no doubt, I think these two are coupled together. This is that because all the disciples would eventually die. John lasting the longest. They go up the mountain. What mountain? Most likely Mount Hermon up in the north. Mount Hermon is 9,400 feet high. Now it could be a spur of the mountain, but nevertheless, that's quite a hike because they're coming from uh, not far from ground level, uh, depending where they are, but uh, that's quite a climb. Uh, that in itself would make them exhausted and tired and might explain uh, the remark of being sleepy. Mount Hermon is an interesting place and it's uh, sort of referred to as Heaven's Gates, maybe from its height, but also in the Old Testament, there's a lot associated with this. And not going into that, uh, my son James had me read a whole book on just Mount Hermon and how it seems to be an access point for spiritual things, uh, for the sons of God and uh, in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, they go up Mount Hermon. Uh, Luke alone explains that the purpose was to pray that this was going to be a very spiritual retreat that Jesus was taking these three uh, disciples along on. And the other disciples, what would they be doing? Not, I don't get the idea that they're waiting at the base of the mountain or anything like that. They're going on with life. And this was just a separate, special, um, as I said, graduate class. And so they are praying. And 
that helps us to understand that Jesus is in that prayer time being transfigured, being glorified, and enjoying that prayer time with two prayer partners, uh, Moses and Elijah, who had never died. Moses had been had died and God buried him, but here we see Moses, clearly identified as Moses, and Elijah. And many would speculate that they will be the two witnesses to come again in the revelation, in the tribulation uh, time. Others might speculate it might be uh, uh, Enoch, uh, Enoch, who was also translated in Elijah, because those two had never had a chance to die, uh, whatever. But Jesus has prayer partners there. And I like the way Luke calls us that they, uh, he, he speaks of this, they were discoursing with him. They spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Not an upcoming news event that Jesus would be killed or Jesus would die, but that he would accomplish. Jesus would willingly give up his life and place himself at the hands of the Gentiles and the Jews. Very careful wording here, and Luke is precise with his words here. We see that it's Moses, the lawgiver, and Elijah, the first of the great prophets. Both of these would be great uh, helps in confirming to Peter that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Now Jesus is, or uh, Peter has already uh, confessed that and uh, very adamantly, and yet Jesus knows that Peter, James, and John might very well need even more because more would be expected of them. The disciples were heavy with sleep, but they do wake up. They do catch enough that the recording of this is their recording. And Peter has a brilliant idea. Don't you just see it? Uh, Peter is like so many of us. We can't just take in a situation and receive. We, we have to contribute. We have to interact. We have to be part of it. We have to own it. And of course, let's hold on to this situation. Let's, uh, let's not let this mountain high literally stop. And so he wants to create some booze, uh, perhaps makeshift shelters of uh, pine boughs or whatever, like uh, the tabernacling for the Feast of Tabernacle or maybe some tent-like structures, but he wants to make some structures so they can perhaps stay longer, stay overnight, and just be together. Um, but Luke records for us, and I believe the other Gospels as well, he doesn't know what he was saying. Speaking without the, the mouth in gear, without the, uh, the mouth in motion, without the brain in gear as the saying goes. The cloud envelops the mountain. I, uh, not to be disrespectful, but it reminds me of a cone of silence in the old Get Smart uh, TV series. Uh, a cloud envelops them, just surrounds them, here, and then you're going to get the surround sound. This is my beloved son, my one and only son, my cherished son. And what's the instruction? Hear him. Hear him. You don't need to do the thinking for him. You don't need your agenda. You don't need to figure it out. Just hear him. Walk with Jesus. Hear him. Keep quiet. This is too special and they need process, uh, processing time. Okay, They keep quiet. They cannot even relate this to the other disciples, at least not immediately. How impactful was it? Let us look at Peter's uh, remembrance of this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. We did not follow cunningly devised fables. He's talking to uh, the, the lady elected the church and saying, we didn't find, uh, follow cunningly devised fables. We haven't been fooled into being these, these disciples. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And we have the famous verse there, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What is Peter reminding us? This walk with Jesus, this ministry of Jesus, this tremendous venture that we've been walking through isn't a cunningly devised fable, an oft-told tale. It's not something that they could have dreamed up, but it was confirmed by God the Father directly from heaven, and they have seen Jesus in all his majesty. And we should be the amazed people of an amazing God. I leave you with a simple instruction, hear him. Thank you.